For off-grid electrification. Now, a 2019 CEPLAT report on Nigeria's energy transformation stated that renewable energy and natural gas will be the largest contributors to global electricity generation by 2040. Considering that the Niger Delta has an abundance of gas resources and already existing supplies, it is important to consider the possibilities of leveraging gas for electrifying underserved communities. Our panelists will discuss feasible models, opportunities, challenges, and risks involved in gas to power off grid electrification. On the panel today, we have engineer Dagogo Jack, the executive chairman, Jack Reynolds Engineering. He has served Nigeria in various capacities as a member of the, of the Presidential Action Committee on Power chairman of the Presidential Tax Force on Power, senior special assistant to the president uh, and senior performance monitor for the National Integrated Power Projects, managing over 400 infrastructure projects across Nigeria's electricity value chain. We also have engineer Frank Edozier, director of power component at the UK Nigeria Infrastructure Advisory Facility he served as the CEO of Neconde Energy. He also worked as a senior power consultant at the UK NIEF, a subset of the UK DFID. From 2013 to 2015, he was the senior special advisor to the Honorable Minister for Power, working as a member of the policy-making body responsible for the national power sector. He was also a member of the team that developed the Nigerian 30-year National Integrated Infrastructure Master Plan. On the panel, we also have Dr. Ubani Inkagineme, CEO, Total Support Energy Group. He has delivered the first truly Nigerian compressed natural gas infrastructure, the University of Port Harcourt IPP, as well as energy solutions for Ari Ariaria International Markets in Abia State. He is currently involved in the ongoing nationwide national gas expansion program rollouts. So these are our panelists for this evening. For the next 15 minutes, we are going to have the first panel session, which will focus on causes, challenges, and status. So let me welcome engineer Dagogo Jack. He's going to Thank be you. the first person I will ask some questions this evening. So you're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. And hello to the panelists. Frank and uh, Yubi. Thank you, thank you. So, Engineer Dagogo Jack, for a country with about 200 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves, one would expect that decentralized gas to power systems would be commonplace. However, we see only a few of these across the country. Why is that the case? What factors need to be addressed to change this particular situation? Yeah, I, I think uh, the facts are clear. Um, it had a lot to do with the way the industry was ruled out in Nigeria in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s. The extant law we have, the Petroleum Act, 1969. If, if you look through it, you won't even believe that there's anything called gas. So there was absolute lack of, you know, intelligence or knowledge relative to, we became oil and gas industry by way of public perception of so much um, ignorance have been made since then, in large part. Um, it seems we may have lost him, but uh, he will definitely be back. So in the meantime, let's uh, move on to, yes, let's move on to Dr. Ubani. Sir, please share your experiences on project development and operations of the Ari Ari IP in Abia State. Dr. Obani, please. Okay, I believe you can hear me. Can you yes, hear me I clearly? I can hear you, I'm sure others can too. Okay, I'll yes, try and be as brief you, as possible. Uh, we could talk about Ari Ari all day, but I'll try and tell you as much as I can in a minute or so. 
Um, Ari area, for those who do not know, is the largest market east of the Niger. Um, we do have a picture which um, Omono will probably project. But this market for the last 40 years before 2019 didn't really have power. They had some rudimentary power earlier, but at some point they had falls that caused the market to burn down. So they disconnected completely. What we did was come back in there, look at the market and their energy needs nearly every trader was running on some type of generator i passed my neighbor diesel gen um, as at the time we started the project we had over four thousand generators in there so you can imagine the noise what we did was basically build a brand new generation capacity, brand new distribution capacity and brand new metering capacity for every shop. Uh, Ariaria has about 37,000 shops. We've just taken on um, about six, 7,000 and we are ramping up quickly. The project itself was very challenging. Um, it's swampy. So we had to dig down like four meters and come back up to be able to build a stable IPP. Same with distribution, same with metering, as you can imagine. Uh, the other challenge which we had and still have was interface with the DISCO. As soon as we started this project, DISCO felt threatened. So they took us to court, but we made sure we did everything by the book. So basically that court case they've lost round one uh they've gone to appeal we know they will lose that as well um there's in calls to settle out of court that we think it makes sense to set this precedent um there's always this myth that the disco has absolute monopoly in their franchise area that is not true that's one of the challenges we have to deal with and this will funnel back into what we are talking about today. How do we get power to our people? We have to have policy and rules that make it possible to disconnect from the grid without being penalized. We have to make it possible for business to look at the huge energy gap as an investment opportunity to go in and solve a problem and and also in a living. Um, maybe we'll go a bit deeper as we move along. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So if I may just ask you, so area area markets, the, the shops that you are supplying power to, what sources are they running on? Is it just gas mm -hmm. or is it a hybrid sources like gas and renewables? That's a great question. Currently, we are running purely on gas. Um, we do have access to CNG, uh, which is how we started. As of a few months ago, Shell has hooked us up to pipeline gas. Currently, there are challenges with the pipeline gas, so we are back on CNG. Again. So it's good to have that kind of back on. So if you're going to do a project like this, we strongly recommend, besides if you're having running on CNG and you have access to pipeline gas, get it. But in some situations, as in most of the Niger Delta, we do not have pipeline access. So it's either going to be CNG or LNG. We are also planning to have some solar hybrid. If you look at the picture of the market, you'll see some of the new buildings, they have fairly decent rooftops. So as we ramp up, we're going to have close to half a meg of solar that will be mixed in here. So currently we are fueling our generators purely on natural gas, but in the next year or two, we are going to ramp up to as much as half a megawatt of solar. Okay, thank you very much, sir. 
Uh, sorry about your network, uh, engineer, the Google Jack, <laughs> but I want I'm you sure. to talk more about what you think we need to address in Nigeria to increase our off-grid power uh, uh, sources. What do we need to do to mm. make sure that we have all access to more off-grid options? Mm. So we lighten the weight on the national grid. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's important we understand that the national grid and the off-grid are parallel state. They are not competing with one another. But as we speak, I don't think I'm convinced that there is a national off-grid power plan agenda, roadmap, what have you. You see, you can't build something on top of nothing. So a, a lot of people are going in there as wild cutters, as people who want to deliver service and end revenue. But what is the platform upon which this business is taking place? As you can see, the RUEA has taken some space there, more out of a desire to, for them to also contribute their quota but not off of a very clear uh, market model that is clear for investors to analyze and come into play. So for me, the first step is to determine the market framework for off-grid. If you are able to do that and you have clarity on how you want to nurture off-grid market development, you will increasingly see participation in that space. Down the line, I would also put a, a nexus. There's a nexus between the off-grid and the national grid power, because both of them are all market investments, if you like. Now, the current dysfunctions we have in the NESI will, will have a contagious effect on whatever model you're trying to do in the off-grid. So if you don't want to transfer the contagion, you need to go back to NESI and have some kind of healing process in the NESI so that the investment confidence from NESI will overflow into the off-grid. It's the same economy, it's the same country, it's the same risk profiling. So if you haven't gotten it right from NESI, why would you expect that there will be a lot of attraction on the off-grid side of the market? So for me, it's good for political leadership, political will to come on board and get the technocrats, get the industry to sit together begin to show how NESI can work very well over a time period. And off of that, develop an off-grid market structure, working with state government, local government. Because don't forget that off-grids can operate within the confine of an LGA. The, the, both the customers, everything can happen in the LGA. So there is no need for off-grid to be a major national uh, activity. So to that extent, you need to create synergy between the federal, yes. the state, and the LGA in trying to design that off-grid market. So I will stop for now. And if you have more questions, I can help you. OK. OK, thank you very much. So let me go over to engineer Frank Edozie. You're welcome to the webinar, sir. Please, what would a typical small-scale off-grid gas-to-power value chain look like? from the point of accessing the raw material to the final point of delivery to the consumer? Yeah, the answer to that question is, um, the, is, not, is not straightforward. And um, the, the key thing there would be to start looking at it from the point of view of an investment. So far, many of the, uh, in fact, almost all of the mini grids that have gone into, uh, into operation apart from areas like Ari Aria or um, the, um, other, other markets, um, have gone in with a don't know funding type of mentality, expecting that there will be uh, always donor funds to support what they're doing. If you flip the thinking and you ask yourself the question, how do I make money out of the investment that is going on, going on in here, then you start with what is it that the market is offering? How many, how many paying consumers are in here? What can they pay? And from that, you, you integrate backwards to the design of, of your system. 
I mean, for for an uh, a gas powered off grid off grid um, uh, system, it makes sense to locate your generation close to the source of gas. And as natural as the gas can be made, the cheaper it is. Therefore, having natural gas or compressed natural gas gives you cost advantages in um, the fuel that, that, that provides um, the, the, the raw material into your generation. Now, if you have the, the current regulation from uh, the, the regulator about mini grids, you are limited to one megawatt. That is the maximum um, capacity of, of a mini grid. But you have gas generators that go all the way from 20, 20 kilowatts to 50 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts, 700 kilowatts, and, and so on, up until you get, to, you get to one megawatt. So what is the size of the community that, the, the load from the community that you, 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 are, you are targeting? That will determine the size of, of the kind of generator that you are uh, you're targeting. And, and by the way, which is quite important when you're looking at value that can yield profit. If you're generating power into communities uh, that have no business going, you will struggle to make money from it. So what is your anchor load that will carry most of the um, generation that you're, you're creating and then the rest can spread uh, as um, more as goodwill into, into, the, into the community. So the, the number of factors that you need to consider and that is one of the things uh, from UK and IF that we're doing at the moment. What is the framework? What is the best framework for designing a commercially sustainable mini grid? We have to find the answer to that question. Nobody goes into this expecting to, to get in hand off every, every year. There is a business to be done and people get into business so they make investments and make money. So the answer to the question is what configuration best makes money for me in the setting that I'm getting into? Let me stop there. Maybe there are questions, other further questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's a very good way to answer the question. <laughs> so, yeah, Google Jack. Please, yeah. sir, con considering the current off grid market climate, would investors be inclined to invest in off grid gas systems? Like you said earlier, yes, you said if we haven't gotten the, the current national grid, we haven't gotten the, everything about it, like the economics, the policy, we haven't gotten that right. Why would people want to invest in off grid? Now, can you just enumerate for me what are these gaps that we need to fill? What other gaps do we need to fill so that investors can be interested in investing in off grid gas systems? Is, is that your cutting off? So I didn't get part of it, but. Were you talking about low hanging fruits or you were talking about uh, enabling the environment for accelerated investments? I will speak to both of them. Um, in so far as low hanging fruits or opportunities for the growth of the upgrade is concerned, I need us to understand really that electricity development is not conducive to shortcuts quick fixes, short guns, they don't work that way. Every electricity project stays on the drawing board until the revenue assurance securities are tangible, can be touched. So the guy knows that every, every kilowatt hour will translate to some revenue in the bank. Now, it, it doesn't matter whether it's upgrade or it's a grid power, national grid power, the model is the same. So in designing the project, you're going to be sure that the day you finish, revenue starts to flow. And uh, Frank spoke to that earlier on. We need to understand that if you look at upgrade, for instance, almost all of the, from the flight gas, all of them are in far-flung communities that are isolated. 
from the rest of peri-urban and urban centers, several kilometers away. Uh, if you put the power plant there, you have to come to reality, the fact that the population there have, been, have emigrated to the level of about 60, 70%. The people left there are the lowest who cannot afford to emigrate. Now, they don't have money. So you have to ask yourself, who is going to pay for this power? So again, I go back to policy. I go back to political will. Now, how to resolve that is to reverse the, the migration. You reverse migration by infrastructure investment. So if there is a road that is a convenient linkage between urban and that community, people can go back and forth. If there are schools, there is hospital, there is market. Each of these have state actors that have to play their role. You begin to see that the population is reversing. The IOCs have been working there for forever. They owe us something. If the IOC in partnership with private sector puts down an agreed project or a manufacturing project in that cluster, you see that between the road, the schools, the health facilities, and this project, you already have a base load that is attractive for somebody to say, let me drop my power plant next to the flare gas. If you haven't done that homework, you're just trying to breed white elephants all over the place. They will start, but they will fizzle out and they will be there for as monuments for people to see, but they won't be able to produce power beyond max of one and a half years. So the point we have made, and I think um, uh, Frank also spoke to it, is to start from first principles. Hold people accountable. The federal government must do its duty to make sure that those flare communities are restored. The state government will do its duty to make sure that schools, hospitals, so, so, so are being built. When you have those two running Paris Passu, you will see that the power project just keys behind it on a viable platform. We can also say that if you look at the uh, flare gas commercialization program, it didn't say that you must build a power plant. It says that they will sell the flare gas to you. So a lot of people will be there looking for how to pipe the flare gas after treatment into a major trunk where they can uh, vector it to a point of sale and get some revenue. That means that they might be able to make commercial success out of it. But the flare communities which have been completely finished because of environmental and other conditions will not have a share of this particular value chain process I just described to you. Nothing will happen to them. So I'll go back. If you want low hanging fruit or if you want investment momentum, go back and set the market right, go back and set the environment right and begin to nexus both regulation and uh, investments. It's not, it's nothing more complicated, but it's nothing, it's, it cannot be more more simple than that. If you don't approach it that way, you're going to have a carpet beggars. People come into the system, they see the shortcut, they see one quick win, so-called quick win. They do the investment. If it goes bad, the banks and other people are all over the place, but we didn't achieve the program we intended to have achieved. So now I'm just speaking to whether we have low hanging fruits or whether what do we do to get the market uh, moving. To get the market moving, we need to set up a market framework. Luckily, the PIB can throw up a regulator midstream. Most of the job will have to do with around gas and probably downstream. Don't forget that if we get the flare gas right, we're talking about gas to power, we're talking about gas to vehicle fuel because diesel is being considered to be replaced by gas downstream, down the line. We're talking about industries, welding, welding industries and what have you. We're talking about even health, agriculture, fertilizer. So to that extent, there is a lot of value chain connections, linkages between gas and many other factors. But without addressing the substrate infrastructure requirement, it's impossible to make a jump over those hurdles. Thank you. Um, just to add to what Dagogo has just said, it, it's very important to look at this challenge holistically. Uh, let's start from where they are flaring gas, especially if they are resident communities near the flare. You need to deal with those first. 
If they happen to be near the grid, that's even a major plus because if you're able to take them off the food chain, that means you have more power for the rest of the grid to have. Um, I cannot overemphasize the need for policy to actually meet practice when it comes to this flare gas matter. Um, just so we put things in, in perspective, currently, as of today, we are flaring enough gas to produce 7,000 megawatts. That's a lot of power. That's more power than we actually use today. So it's critical that we're able to harness this gas. It's critical that we're able to deal with these low hanging fruits where these flare gas communities are. And by the way, if we are going to talk holistically, we need to deal with using this natural gas we have in excess for transportation, for fuel, besides power, it's not just power. And one of the objectives of the flare out program is to be able to make natural gas available nationwide. The way we are going to do it is to be able to price this gas cheap enough for investors to be able to harness this gas, turn it into CNG, LNG, and move it nationwide everywhere and the price should be cheaper than the price of petrol today. It turns out the answer to can it be done, the answer is a definite yes. However, there are quite a bit of policy disconnects that must be reconnected or the connections made where there is not. Let me just stop. So. Okay, let me, let me uh, add, to, uh, add to that. I mean, um, both uh, Bex and, uh, and Obani have spoken uh, significantly to the challenges with um, flared gas. Uh, and there are a lot. And in my own view, my humble view, uh, dealing with uh, flared gas is actually not low hanging fruit. It takes, it takes a lot of thinking and investment before we can put ourselves in the position that we harness that gas. So the truth is across the board, most of the gas that we flare are in areas where they cannot immediately be utilized. Therefore, the need for infrastructure to collect the gas and get them to where they can then be um, utilized, either for power or for um, processing into to other forms to support our industry. But Nigeria is so blessed with natural gas resources. Apart from what is the, the ample supply that we have in the, in the Niger Delta, we also have gas in the inland basins. And a lot of this gas by policy has been neglected. And uh, the, the, the natural geography in the inland basins is, you have many of these um, uh, accumulations of gas not far from population centers, where if only we had geared our policy towards utilizing the gas, we would be able to set up lots of power plants that are probably in the 50 megawatt range, 40, 50, 60, 70 megawatt range, that would serve as mini grids to areas that are not connected onto the grid and can also serve as interconnected mini grids to support the on-grid system in areas where they are struggling with you know, long um, uh, transmission line, line extensions. So we are missing a huge opportunity there. And it goes back to the you know, Petroleum Act and the way it deals with the, um, the reserves in, in those inland, inland basins. The onerous tasks that the owners of those um, uh, oil, oil fields or gas fields have to go through to bring the field to, to maturity, to go from OPL to OML such that they can begin to, uh, to, to harness the gas. There's a huge opportunity uh, in there for um, the country to one, build many grids that are gas driven, but also importantly, to reduce the cost of 
building solar plants. If you set up a, a solar um, power plant in any area, you use the power when there is a sun. If you want to access the power when there is no sun, you have to provide for accumulation. And if you have an inverter in your house, you know that a lot of the cost goes to accumulation when you have to get batteries. If we had these inland small uh, power, power generation fired by gas, then you can combine solar production from daytime, uh, during the daytime with gas from uh, power that is, sorry, generated all through the day and reduce the cost of power uh, that goes into the communities. I guess the cost crux of my argument is what we can do off grid should be a combination of a number of ample resources that we have. Gas is one, solar is one, hydro is another one. We have so many river flows that have enough head to give us power generation if only we had policy that was driving in that area. So I, I agree entirely with, with Bex. We need to take a critical look at the policies that we have that create the marketplace that enables investors to be attracted to, the, to our, to our off-grid off space. At the moment, we are chasing after, after solar, largely because there's a lot of donor money that is going after it. But that is only a small piece of the puzzle that we need to solve. Let me end and uh, maybe there's other contributions. Okay. Thank you so much for your responses. I think we have a few follow-up questions from your responses, but we, I can see that we are a bit fast spent on time, so it would be great to get the feel of the audience right now. Let's know what the audience is thinking. Um, currently, we have a couple of questions and I will read them out. So the first question goes to Dr. Ubani. Someone would like to know, okay, yeah, Afolabi Davidson would like to know, which one is cheaper, CNG or pipeline gas and why? Over to you, Dr. Ubani. Well, there are two answers to that. The straightforward answer is that pipeline gas is cheaper than CNG. Uh, remember, you have to take the gas from a pipeline or from a flare site, for instance, clean it up and then make CNG. So ab initio, your pipeline gas is going to be cheaper. But if you go to a wellhead and you get the gas for free or very cheap, you may find that your CNG starts to be very near the cost of pipeline gas. Now this question indirectly also speaks to what I was saying earlier. These flare gases, if we make it cheap enough, we may be able to get gas to every nook and corner of this nation at close to pipeline prices. So it's very important, again, just backing up to what uh, Frank and Dagogo has said earlier. Policy is important. We must get our policy to meet what is obtainable out there in the real world. There's no point having policies that are just up in the air without backing it up to what people can really run with. Definitely. Um, so going to the next question from Evans King. Now he's asking, why are investors not showing enough interest in gas pipeline network infrastructure development in the country? Can this be due to government policies hindering this process? I mean, that's, it's about what you just spoke to, I, I, I think. So, but then apart from the government policies hindering the process, maybe you could let us know if there are other reasons that um, investors are not currently showing sufficient interest. I think this question, Engineer Frank, if you could answer this question, thank you. 
Okay. Um, gas, in a way, is is a closed a closed business. So you, you don't start producing gas if you don't have the market for the gas. In fact, next to um, exotic cars, you have you have gas in the sense that you actually pay for gas before it is produced. Therefore, it doesn't attract itself naturally to prospective investors. You can't go and build a pipeline in an area where you don't know um, where your gas is coming from and perhaps where you haven't committed by contract to the gas to a market that you don't know that exists. That is one of the key challenges you have with the gas infrastructure, right? There is a secondary problem, which is linked with um, the uh, notions of notions of insecurity uh, that have attended a lot of our public infrastructure and especially um, uh, infrastructure re relating to um, oil and gas. Yeah, people uh, think that there's a lot of challenges with gas pipelines, yeah? In the least case, people might go and break into the gas pipeline thinking they'll find uh, a liquid product. So um, it's not one that lends itself to um, unrisked investment in, in, that, in, in, that, in that manner. However, to go back to what I said before, where you find an opportunity, either you're close to um, a flare site, or you are close to a wellhead somewhere, close to, say, within a kilometer or so, there's a lot of sense in building gas utilization infrastructure, such as a power plant in that area, such that you can utilize the gas for power generation or to, to drive, drive an industry. In a way, the project that um, Albani has is, is that same principle. It's, uh, that is closed, there are a number of wells that are around there and you don't have long pipelines. So they can take advantage of that in providing gas to their, to their facility. Yeah, I might want to add to what Frank has said, um, which, is to, which is to say that um, pipeline investment oftentimes are national asset investments, not necessarily private sector investments. So again, it goes back to policy, it goes back to leadership. There are certain, if you look at the Ajakuta Katuna Kano uh, pipeline, essentially government can come in and pipelines are like roads. You can raise the capital through bonds, long-term bonds and fly the pipelines across your country and incentivize people to begin to build businesses off of that network. But even before you do that, you're going to have a regulation. You're going to have a network code. You're going to have the things that control access to that pipeline in and out. All of that is a lot of heavy lifting in terms of preparing the place to work as a commercial business. So, but insofar as being government being able to build some pipeline networks all over the place. It's a more of a national preparation for shifting your economy in the direction where your economy should go. You won't wait for private investors to do that. You as government will take the bull by the horn, will take that risk. Once you've taken the risk, you set up a regulatory and investment model that makes sense. People know that the backbone is there. The backbone for gas business is the pipe. Of course, the processing is in the back end and all that. But if you've done expenditure on pipes, I can tell you that you will begin to drive appetite for business. People will begin to tap into that pipe for whatever else they want to do, far away from where you started. So I just wanted to chip that in so far as how we can incentivize the pipeline development. Government must take a big chunk of that risk and allow business to lap onto it. Thank you. Thank you yeah, very much. Just to, just to reinforce what Doug Google has just said. Okay. Uh, let me use practical example. There's a reason you have clusters of industries in the Keja or my area. Ab initial government made the investment to get pipeline gas there. 
same thing goes for Ota. Same thing goes for Abba. Um, if government doesn't do these things, private industry will normally justify a pipeline if there's enough demand for it. So it's a bit of chicken and egg. Government has to decide, do we want to do this or not? A classic example is the AKK pipeline. The only way that pipeline can be justified is for government to put two or three massive power stations up north. Otherwise, you will just build that and there is no one taking the gas. So government has a lot really to do if we want to get pipelines as nationwide. All right, thank you so much, sir. I would like to hear us, um, let allow us hear from Lanre. Lanre has had his hand up for quite a while, so I would unmute you right now, Lanre, if you're still here. Please ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you, Larry. Okay, yeah, my question goes to um, Engineer Frank. I know what his organization, UK NAI, is trying to do uh, for the federal government in transiting to uh, a medium-term electricity market. So I just want to ask you a question. Is our country ready for that market now, a competitive electricity market? Because we're talking about liquidity problem, we're talking about but liquidity, liquidity is a major problem we're having in the, country, in the country right now. So I want to ask, is the market ready for a medium-term electricity market where there's retail competition? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that question, um, uh, Larry. The uh, direct answer to your question, is the country ready today is no. The country is not ready today. Uh, nobody is, uh, I don't think there's anybody proposing that we um, enter the medium term market today. But th there are some characteristics that mark out the medium term market, uh, one of which is um, cost reflective tariffs, this has to be liquidity and so on. And a lot is being done to, um, you know, get, the, get, the, get us back on track towards, um, you know, towards those things. And uh, therefore, it makes sense to set out a roadmap that will take us to that destination. Remember, we're on a journey of a four stage market, the medium term market being the, the, third, the third stage. So you set out the roadmap and then look at all of the things that you need to do to attain the readiness for the medium term market. That is one way of making sure that everybody by policy, by action, um, by regulation that we point all our noses in the same direction. That essentially is um, what UKNIF is um, providing support to the different um, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies involved with the power sector to point us in that direction. Because we, we have to, as a nation, get to this position where provision of electricity is not an issue for national discourse. Elsewhere, if people take it for granted, Nigeria should be able to get to that, to that position. And it only takes decided action following a plan to get us there. Yeah, can I, let, me, let, me, let me support uh, Frank a little bit there. Because I, I know where, I, I can get a sense of where the the questionnaire is coming from, but I, I need to drop some ideas that can be used to, to react to that question, to deal with that question. You know, the market is dynamic. Now, after the privatization, which most people would call the first wave of the market, there are subsequent waves behind the first wave and the elements of those subsequent waves are well known. You know, for instance, I can give you an example. When the transition was made to, to private hands, the first focus was to take business out of the hands of government, which has done it very badly for so many decades. 
Now, that didn't mean that what happened was the best thing that could happen. Going forward, there is a reform pressure that can unbundle, say, Portaco Tisco, which has about four states in its jurisdiction. That is the second wave that most people were expecting because investors will come in. The original winner of that uh, license, that concession, will be left with a component of the jurisdiction that he can manage because he's held it for five years, six years. The regulator, the market operator, the bulk trader, everybody can present data to him that you are overwhelmed by this uh, size of investment that is in your portfolio. So NEC is empowered from the one, from the EFCR 2005, to go in there and remove components of that disco and reconcession those ones. That is the second wave that would have started playing out if we kept our eyes on the ball. But I don't think that this is the space for that discussion. But to, to tell you that the market gets ready when people make the market ready, the market doesn't get ready by itself. A market cannot be growing and you're filling it up with liabilities, with bad debts, with no tariff review as and when due. If you are the one doing that to that market and you want the market to be ready, you want to ask yourself some honest questions. So the point is that market is made to grow from wavelength to wavelength. The second wavelength is within our reach, but there are some bold decisions to be made so that we can get to the second wavelength. We don't take our eyes off the ball. The one thing we cannot change is that this business cannot go back to government again. All of us have to accept that, but we have to make it work by being engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. For the sake of time constraints, we would have to move on. We will take two more questions and um, please try to respond. Try to ask your question and try to respond in as brief a manner as possible. So now I'll be calling on Daniel CEO. Please ask your question, Mr. Daniel. You can unmute, Daniel. Oh, I might have hit that uh, button in uh, error. Apologies. It's okay, you're good. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next person. Are you sure when we more? Are you still available to ask a question? Are you sure when we more? Please unmute and ask your question. Okay, so we will need to move on. Shola Ephraim Olua Muga, are you available to ask your question? Please ask your question, Mr. Shola. Any responses? I didn't hear his question. Okay. Yes, ne ne neither can I. All right, so we would uh, move on. Let's take a few questions from chat. Now, um, someone, someone is asking a really basic but important question. This question is from Amado. It says, natural gas looks like it looks and, and it has no order in case, and in case of pipeline leakages, do you not think it is risky to deploy electrical gas plants far from the gas source? Uh, when, when this person says electrical gas plants, I'm assuming the person means electric gas, thermal electricity plant. Um, this question will be most appropriate for Dr. Ovani. Dr. Ovani, please. Thank you. It, it looks like a simple question, but it's also a very important question. Uh, a few basic things about natural gas. 
natural gas in its normal form is odorless. So if it's leaking, you will not smell it. But also natural gas in its natural state is much lighter than air. So if it leaks, it will normally just rise and disappear. Um, if you're talking of whether it is dangerous to have a power plant where you have a leaking uh, gas pipeline, uh, any leak of natural gas is dangerous. But normally, if you're operating a pipeline, you will have systems to detect the leak. If you're operating from a regular pipeline, actually, the gas is blended with what we call mecathan, like an odorant. So it's introduced into the gas. So if you have a leak, you can actually smell it. But natural gas in, in its natural state is odorless. That, uh, I hope that helps you with answering that question. All right, I believe that would help anyone listening with the question. Now we will need to go into the second aspect of this dialogue. That's where we'll be asking questions that align more to um, proposed solutions and, and actions to ensure that we have more um, gas off-grid electrification across the country. Now, I will start from, yes, I would like to start with um, Engineer Reynolds, Dr. Bojack. Now, earlier on, we discussed the issue of policy intersecting practice when it comes to gas flaring. Now, we know that Nigeria has quite a number of policies. Even if in many cases they are inadequate, but even the policies available are hardly being practiced, which is what you mentioned earlier. Now, in the case of gas um, flaring commercialization, now, who are the key actors to ensure that policy meets practice? Who are the key actors to ensure that the, 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 the agencies, the gas companies put the policies into practice. Who are the key, the key actors and what exactly do they need to do in this regard? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stuff in one bag, but let me try to unpack a little bit. Um, on the face of it, the gas um, flare gas commercialization agenda uh, is innovative on the face of on the face of it. It's not. It's something we should embrace to try and resolve the sixty-year-old gas flare problem. But when you dive deeper, you, when you dive deeper, you may you may confront the sense that there was a little bit of hurry to get to that policy point uh, because when you are selling flare gas, pretty much the same, the same way you are selling a commodity or crude oil or something. But the flag gas location, the flag gas processing, the flag gas transportation to the market uh, from flat to market, all those are serious investment overlays on just, not just the gas. So if somebody auctions off the gas, what happens next? So who, got, who carries out the processing? Is that part of its cost? Who provides the willing investment to will? If he builds a power plant there, who provides the willing investment from that point to the consumer uh, doorstep? I see a lot of, um, if you like, structural issues that will make it difficult for investors to step in. And um, Ubani is there, my friend. He's in the sector, he's in the space. I don't know whether there is stampede. I don't know whether there is stampede. There's a lot of rush. To be, to be involved with the commercialization program by investors. And if there is none, I can only interpret that to mean that we have rushed to the point of selling a commodity without providing for the underlying linkages uh, uh, that will make that commodity uh, viable for the person buying it. So to that extent, I, we're almost being pushed back to the point of supporting the NGFCP agenda with a federal state policy that enables that 
that uh, process to work in a viable market setting. For want of, I probably don't know what more to add to it because I see that you can announce that you want to sell flared gas, but who is buying? Uh, Ubani will buy because he's able to uh, convert it to CNG and lift it to the point of need. How many Ubanis do we have in the market space? And if we're talking about the, the trillions of uh, millions of coffee that we want to sell, is that the right model to go about it? So uh, I go back to framework, and it looks like framework for the entire market must be in place. And the NGFCP will just be a component of the market framework, rather than we're taking it piecemeal or shortcut. That's probably the feedback I'd like to give on it. But I'm sure my other colleagues will add something here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, let me. Okay, okay. Let me just reinforce what Dan Google has just said. Uh, there is actually a direct connection between the market and whether we can actually drive the flare gas program to closure. Um, a classic example is the price has to be right. If we do not get power to where we are paying cost reflective tariff, the same for fuel for vehicular use, we'll just be shooting in the wind. Uh, let me bring this down to practical implications. Today, gasoline costs 160, 170. We need to actually create a market where all these flare gas will go to. If the market is not there, no investor will put his money in there. But if we say, okay, as a nation, in two years time, all vehicles, commercial, will need to be able to run on gas or fuel or both. And we set that as a policy, we set that as a law, and you give people time to be able to adapt to that. And we also say, okay, we are moving to cost reflective tariff and we develop the political will to speak to it and we put a date to when we are going to make that transition. A couple of things will happen. It will tell investors that government is serious about this. Not a exactly. case of where you say I'm increasing tariff today, tomorrow you back down. It sends completely wrong signals to the private industry. So if we do these things, you will see that people can go and take the flare gas and sell the equivalent of one liter of petrol for 120, 139. You don't need to convince people to switch. People will switch because it is cheaper, it is cleaner. The same thing will go to power generation. Let me use the project we are driving today somewhere in quality. The reason that project can go forward is for the simple fact that we will be able to make power and sell it to the public cheaper than what Benin Bistro can sell it. Having said that, it's not that straightforward. There are all kinds of hoops you have to do. You will make sure that you're doing everything legally. You will make sure that you can get permits for projects of this nature. You will make sure that if Benin Disco challenges you, you can pay. You will make sure that the local government, the state government is aligned with this type of project. And there's something we are not even talking about today, which is like the big elephant in the room. Unless this country changes to things that will create massive employment. We will be sitting on a ticking time board, which actually we are sitting on a ticking time board. These are the type of projects that will create thousands, millions of jobs nationwide. So as a nation, we really need to focus and take this seriously. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. 
very elaborate explanation. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Obani, <laughs> sorry to come back to you again, but this question is for you. To what extent is it possible to replicate the grid thermal technology in all grid settings in, in terms of grid size and efficiency? Of course, using Aria Aria as an example. Uh, there are two, two answers to two would I say two sections to the answer to that question. One is technical, the other one is commercial. Technically, this is a no brainer. We can make clean, commercially viable power as low as five kilowatts. Uh, today, for gas fueled generation infrastructure, you're looking at about $1,000 per kilowatt. For solar, you're looking at about $2,000, $3,000 per kilowatt. Now, is there space for both? The answer is yes. But having said that, I go back to what I just talked about, where we can say, yes, we are making off-grid power. It needs to be competitive. It needs to be at best cheaper than what the grid is doing. And technically it's very feasible because when you generate power where you need it, you cut out all the losses from generation to transmission to distribution, you have lots of loss. So you will be able to do that in a commercially viable manner. It's, it's not enough for it to be technically viable. It has to be also commercially viable. Yeah, thanks, uh, Omono. Uh, I didn't quite um, uh, hear you, but I, I thought you were... Okay, I thought you were talking about um, the inland basins and, and what they can be. I spoke to this subject a little earlier, but let me let me be more uh, more specific. In uh, in the oil and gas industry, when you get a concession, you have what is called an oil prospecting license. Yeah, sorry, oil pros prospecting uh, lease. Okay. Before you can start making use of that piece of property that you have, you need to go through a number of tests and um, the analysis to convert your license to a lease, an oil mining lease. In the inland, inland basin, the requirements placed on license owners by DPR are as onerous as are placed on big players in the big fields uh, in the Niger Delta and offshore. It therefore becomes very, very difficult to find all of the investments that need to go in to do the conversion from an OPL to an OML at which point you can start exploiting the gas that is there. What you find across the land in the inland basin is that many of the fields there were previously prospected by the oil majors. So we know where the gas accumulations are. If the policy we had was directed at targeting those gas accumulations, it would be quicker to bring such reserves into production. And as I said before, these reserves can fire um, gas power generation from as low as five kilowatts to as high as 50 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts, and perhaps even 800, one megawatt power plants in the inland basin. So what is required is a relook at the policy to make it easier for holders of the either the licenses or the leases to convert this and start making use of them. Then they can become 
uh, either uh, access points for many grids or interconnected many grids, or maybe even standalone um, uh, generation, as long as an investor can come with a notion of a market from where they can make money, either off grid or as an uh, addendum to uh, to uh, to the on grid to put power in the in the uh, distribution network where grid power might not be able to to get to easily. So, simple answer is to take a look at the policy with a view to enhancing the opportunities to bring the gas to the market. It's a lot easier in the inland basins than it might be with flared gas that's available in um, down south towards in the, in the Niger Delta. Thank you very much, Engineer Frank. So um, I would ask a question real quickly, um, and the next one will go to Dr. Ubani. Now, we know that for this particular purposes, you are a project person. So I'd like to ask you once again, on Ariaria, what lessons can others learn from its development, the construction and the current operation of the IPP? I mean, to what extent can we replicate Ariaria in other parts of the country? Dr. Obani, please. Um, there are lots of lessons that can be learned from Ariara. Uh, the first one is that it can be done. Uh, one other big lesson is that there are still numerous uh, hoops that needs to be jumped in terms of aligning policy to make sure it is easier for Nigerian companies to replicate these. Um, one of the biggest lessons we learned delivering that project is the fact that Nigerians actually pay for services when delivered. And we don't need to go far. Uh, look at our telephone industries. Nigeria is, Nigerians pay for service when they see it. The same goes for airlines, you name it. So we need to take a cost reflective approach to some of these things. It's costing us so much more by not taking that approach. The other lesson we learned is that yes, you can deliver power. You actually have three components of delivering this power. One is generation, the other one is distribution. A very key part of this is metering. From a, a pure business perspective, you can do all the generation you want and distribution. If you're not able to collect your money, that business is dead. So metering is key. Whatever you're doing as a company, you must pay critical attention to metering. You want, you want to be sure that the infrastructure you deploy is smart. You want to be sure that the infrastructure you deploy is robust, easy to use, so that the market woman is able to pay her bills without stressing too much. Paying your bills should not be a difficult thing, it should be easy. One of the other things we also learned is when you're doing a project like this, you must have boots on the ground. You have to have people who are close to the consumer, people who speak the same language as they speak. You have to explain it carefully so that they understand what it is you're talking about. Otherwise, it will not work. I have to sell the value proposition to the consumer. If not, they will tell you, okay, uh, NEPA is cheaper. But when they see the two 
side by side. They compare it to what they are currently doing with their past my neighbor or diesel generator. It becomes very clear, but make no mistake. Nigerians are not hooked on freebies. Nigerians pay their bills when the service is rendered. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Obani. That was very straightforward and uh, direct. So uh, we're going to take questions now from the audience. If anyone has questions for any of the panelists, we want to see your questions so we can ask them and we can round this up. Okay, so I have a question for Dr. Obani. It's from Samuel Timile in Sunday. He's asking, please, can you explain how the Aria Aria uh, project, oh, okay. Please kindly explain how you intend to meet up with the goals of the Aria Aria project. Aba zone has not improved on her generation, transmission and distribution supply. So how is the Aria Aria IPP supposed to work? Okay, the Ariara IPP is captive power. It, it really does not have anything to do with uh, Enugu Disco or Geometric. So this is a standalone captive power project that is targeted at the market. In terms of what we are doing, now, as I said earlier, we did not cover the entire market at the beginning. We're in the process of ramping up to cover the entire market. And the pressure to do that is coming from the market itself, based on the fact that they see the value. Let me give you an example. Before we came on board, the small woman with her small shop running her past my neighbor was spending 600 naira plus on petrol alone daily. And she probably gets three, four hours of power. Today she spends like 200 naira and she gets 10 hours of uninterrupted solid power. So that value is there. And their neighbor who does not have access to the power yet can see that clearly. And that explains why we're under pressure today to ramp up as quick as we can. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, I'm sure it does. Um, so I have a question for you, engineer Dagogo Jack. Assuming the federal government starts to show preparedness to tackle the issues of providing the right policies and investing in the national assets required, what are the anticipated responsibilities or opportunities for the private sector participants to plug into immediately? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I was explaining very quickly that the opportunities are plenty, both in the flare gas sites, as well as inland, um, within the inland basin where there is a lot of gas reserve, but not properly you know, surveyed documented and prepared for investment. So as soon as government takes its rightful place as an enabler, there will be enough incentives to generate interest in the investment community. And it may not look like big ticket projects. It may start small, but it will ramp up very quickly because one proof of concept has a way of uh, enabling the next project to roll out. That's typically how the momentum builds. So, but if the policy is right, like I said, and the market is set up transparently for people to see which part of the market value chain is, is exciting for them to get into, you begin to see things happening. And typically when it, it gets past the tipping point, you don't even know to do anything. The market knows how to take care of itself. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So I have a question for you, Engineer Frank, from Moradeo Onamusi. Is there a particular policy document you advise would need to be referenced 
in addressing the OPL and OML regulations for effective gas utilization for electricity and industrial purposes? Um, at the moment, there, there isn't one. Uh, I don't think there's any, any policy document uh, in the oil and gas industry that is targeting gas for power. And that is something that needs to be put in place. Um, for the reasons that we've discussed and for others, here's an example of another, another reason. A lot of the gas that Nigeria uses to the, today to fire the, power, the gas power plants that we use, a lot of it is coming uh, as associated gas which is gas that is produced as you produce oil. We know the challenges that oil is coming under in the world, selling oil is coming under in the world. And that pressure will continue. If we do not have a policy shift that focuses on the vast reserves of gas that we have in Nigeria, that incentivizes the exploration and exploitation of gas for domestic use and particularly for power, we will run into a brick wall before long. So yes. the, the, the DPR and the Ministry of Petroleum Resources need to take a clear look at the policies for exploration and exploitation of gas, particularly gas that is directed at domestic consumption power and industry. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we have a question from an anonymous person. It said, please share examples of policy disconnects that are being referred to, and if possible, suggest solutions to the misalignment. I think this question will be for uh, Dr. Obani. Um, let, let's take an easy one. Let's look at the policy of moving to cost-reflective tariff. Uh, government should have the political will to back it. And the reason is going to cost-reflective tariff corrects a lot of imbalances in the market. Um, as a nation, we cannot subsidize everything. Subsidy is never sustainable. So we need to do things that will encourage the market to write by itself. And once you allow market forces to come to bear on what affects people, competition will stabilize and then drive down the price. I don't know if that addresses some of the concerns you have. That's a classic example of policy disconnect and flip-flop, actually. Yeah, I can also add a few. I think that when you, when you regularly tamper with the independence of the regulator, and you tend to make the regulator subservient to executive uh, whims and caprices, you endanger the market uh, confidence and you also scare away investors. That's one area of policy flip-flop. Um, there's also a sense that for our particular case, we need the, the transmission company of Nigeria to be not immune from the legal and commercial responsibilities of being in the market. They cannot in one moment be in the market and the next moment they are a government baby and they are protected from this and protection from that. So all those are policy flip-flops, if you like, which can be corrected and it will allow the market to, to mature. It's not going to be overnight, but you don't continue to babysit somebody who is uh, already an adult. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So we are way behind time. So I'll just do a quick summary uh, for all our participants. Thank you so much for attending our webinar on uh, off-grid gas decentralized sources. Um, so to summarize, I think we, we now know that gas can be used while we still explore renewables. 
we can use both sources to form a hybrid so, so, so we can power underserved communities. And also it would be good to, to, uh, for investors, to, for potential investors to note that uh, non-associated gas is always better for power generation it's cheaper and is more reliable because it has nothing to do with crude oil. And uh, we should also uh, recognize the fact that Ari Aria IPP is already, although they are going to still try to spread their tentacles, but they're already supplying power to over 12,000 shops out of the 37,000 that they have. So if you plan to invest in off-grid gas uh, sources, Ariara IPP should be your blueprint. Although the uh, gas pricing as well as the distribution transmission lines are not perfect in the country, it is good for stakeholders to keep pushing makers and the government. So that's now to close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omono. Thank you for your time. I will be doing a vote of thanks on behalf of the Electricity Hall and Next Year Power. I want to say thank you to all our attendees. Thank you for sticking with us from the beginning of this program up until this time. I can see that we still have a few hands up and there are still a few questions that we're not taking, unfortunately. But we will see the possibility of still answering your questions even offline, if it's possible, especially for the questions that were written. So for now, I must say thank you so much to Dr. Fra uh, to Engineer Frank. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And then it's also great to know that UKNAP is trying to do a lot of work in this regard, especially with respect to ensuring commercial sustainability for off-grid projects. Thank you so much for sharing, Engineer Frank. Thank you so much, Dr. Ubani. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing with us about your vast experience in Aria Area. And it's great to know, in fact, it's, it's fantastic to know that Aria Area can be replicated as long as we have the right policies. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, um, Engineer Reynolds, Jack, Dagogo Jack. Thank you for joining us today, for sharing your wealth of experience. Thank you for sharing, for letting us know what it really looks like with regards to gas flaring. It's just giving us a better idea of what's happening in the Niger Delta right now and letting us know, pointing back to the fact again that policy and practice have to work together. So at the end of the day, our key takeaway from this is that we have to go back to the basics we need to go back to policies. Our policies, our frameworks have to be in place. And for that, the government still needs to do a lot of work. So we are making use of this opportunity to call on the government, especially with respect to the power sector. That's calling on the regulator, calling on the Ministry of Power, and um, calling on the Rural Electrification Agency. There is a whole lot of work to be done in this area. And then we have a whole lot of potential if we can put our framework right, we have investors that will be willing to come into this space and ensure that we have better electrification for all Nigerians. So on this note, I will be saying a very happy weekend to every one of us that has joined today. It has totally, totally been a pleasure from beginning to the end. Thank you so much, everyone, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.